This lesson is about grouped data and calculating some statistics on the data when we don't have the original values, we only know the frequency of values within a certain range. For this set of data, we know that we have three scores from 20 to 29, 11 from 30 to 39, but we don't know the actual values of those scores. These scores are placed in groups or class intervals or bins. And the boundaries between the classes, imagine for example we have a score of 39.4, that would go into this bin. And if we had a score of 39.6, it would go into this bin. But the boundary between the two bins is 39.5. Using those class boundaries, we can see that the bin width is 10. Some information is now lost because we do not know the values of the actual scores. However, we can estimate the mean and standard deviation using the midpoint of each interval. We can ascertain the number of scores because that's the sum of all the frequencies. And the modal class is the class with the highest frequency, that's 50 to 59. The median class is the class which contains the median. With 100 scores, we know that's going to be between the 50th and 51st score, both of which are also in the 50 to 59 category. To work out the mean, we would need to know the original data. But to estimate the mean, we take the midpoint of each interval, so that's halfway between 19.5 and 29.5, and so on, and we assume that each of the scores takes that midpoint value. We have three values of 24.5, 11 values of 34.5, and we calculate the mean based on that. And then we divide by 100 because we have 100 scores to give an estimate of the mean to be 55.8. And you should pause the video now to check that you can achieve this estimate of the mean with your calculator. Similarly, we can estimate the standard deviation by assuming that each of the scores takes the midpoint of the class interval to give an estimate of 14.33 for the standard deviation. And again, you should check with your calculator that you can achieve this value by using the midpoints of the class intervals to estimate that standard deviation. Finally, the range can also be estimated using the midpoints of the class intervals, which would give us a range of 60, but we could give a maximum value for the range. The minimum possible value in this situation is 19.5, and the maximum possible value is 89.5. And if we use those two extreme values, that would give us a range of 70. Similarly, we could give minimum possible values for the range using 29.5 and 79.5 to give a minimum possible range of 50. So our estimate for the range is 60, but we can say with certainty that it lies between 50 and 70 as minimum and maximum possible values. Sometimes data can look like discrete exact values when in actual fact it's continuous data which has been rounded. The example here consists of the lengths of 50 newborn babies recorded to the nearest centimetre. So this one baby that's been recorded as 47 centimetres could have been any length between 46.5 and 47.5. This is actually grouped data we have the first class interval with boundaries of 46.5 and 47.5 and then we have three babies 
which measured between 47.5 and 48.5 centimetres. So these values, 47, 48, 49, in actual fact are the midpoints of the class boundaries. And we find this with any measured quantities, because measured quantities are continuous data which is naturally grouped by rounding. What I'd like you to do now is pause the video and calculate all of the statistics from the previous example for this set of data. We want n, an estimate for the mean, an estimate for the standard deviation, the modal class, the median class and the range. In a class test, 15 boys had a mean score of 21.2 and 10 girls in the class had a mean score of 22.4. Now to work out the mean for the entire class, we can't simply average these two scores because there are more boys than girls in the class. We need to use a weighted mean to work out the class mean. In order to work out the total of all scores in the class, we have 15 boys with an average score of 21.2 plus 10 girls with a mean score of 22.4. This tells us the total score of all students in the class. The class mean then divides by the total number of students in the class, which is 21.68. Now sometimes we use weighted means in order to give a higher weighting to particular facets of the calculation. In this example we have four different cars and they've been ranked on cost, safety, performance and style. But we're giving a higher weighting to safety and the lowest weighting to style. To work out the weighted mean for each car we need to multiply its score by the weight and then divide by the total of all of the weights. For car A, that gives a weighted mean of 6.75. Now I'd like you to rank the four cars by calculating the weighted means using the same method. Sometimes data is cropped before performing the calculations. In this example, a competitor receives the following scores from seven judges, but before we calculate the overall score, we remove the highest and lowest values. We take out the 5.9 and the 6.9, and we're left with the five middle values, which we use to calculate the mean. We can also crop data to remove outliers, you should only do this if specifically instructed to do so. If not instructed to crop the data, work with the full set. I'd like you now to pause the video again and calculate the mean and standard deviation for these scores, which are the maximum temperature recorded each day for 21 days. Make sure that you can achieve a mean of 29.5 and a standard deviation of 10.0. Now if you look at the scores it seems that there's an outlier. This 72 is significantly higher than any of the other values. Now I'd like you to recalculate the mean and the standard deviation excluding this value of 72. Check that you can achieve these values. Now I'd like you to think about this question. Are we justified in discarding the outlier? Just because we have a particularly high number, is it appropriate to crop this 72 from the data? Try and think about why there might be this value of 72 and why it might not be appropriate to include it. Also, can you answer this question? What has happened to the standard deviation and can you explain it in terms of the way that we have cropped this data? Pause the video and write down your answers to these questions.
In the final part of this lesson, we're going to look at standard scores. So let's have a look at Amy. She scored 27 in test 1 and 30 in test 2. If we now say that test 1 was out of 40 and test 2 was out of 50, what's your answer now? Perhaps you would convert these scores into percentages. So this looks like she has not improved from test 1 to test 2. But it might be that test 2 was harder than test 1. And so we really need to know the mean scores for the class to see if overall her score was better or worse than the mean. So the mean or the class average for test 1 was 23 and the mean or the class average for test 2 was 25. So we can see that her scores were above the mean each time but how much were they above the mean? This is why we need the standard deviation. The standard deviation for test 1 was 5 marks and for test 2 it was 4 marks. We compare the two assessments by seeing how many standard deviations above the mean Amy's score was. In test 1, the mean plus 1 standard deviation the class mean plus a standard deviation is 28 and Amy scored 27 so her score was just under one standard deviation above the mean. For test 2 the mean plus a standard deviation is 25 plus 4 which is 29 and Amy scored 30 so her score is over one standard deviation above the mean. It looks like she did improve between test 1 and test 2. I'll just recap that again. So looking at the raw scores, her mark was higher in test 2 than in test 1. But if we look at percentages, her percentage was higher in test 1 than test 2. But then looking at the class averages, Amy was above the mean for both tests but her score in test 2 was more than one standard deviation above the class mean and her score in test 1 was less than one standard deviation above the mean. This means that her score in test 2 was comparatively better than her score in test 1. We can be even more specific about Amy's performance by calculating her standardised scores in each of the two tests. This is when we calculate the number of standard deviations above or below the mean. And it's done by subtracting the mean from the raw score and dividing by the standard deviation. A standardised score is also known as a z-score. In symbols, the raw score is the x value. Subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation. In test 1, Amy's z-score was her score of 27. Subtract the mean score of 23 divided by the standard deviation of 5. 4 over 5, which is 0 0.8. Remember we said it was just under one standard deviation above the mean. And in test 2, Amy's score of 30, subtract the mean of 25, divided by the standard deviation of 4. 5 over 4 is 1.25. And if you remember, we said that her score was just over one standard deviation above the mean. Now we've got more accurate values. In test 1, Amy's z-score was 0 0.8, which means her score was 0 0.8 standard deviations above the mean. And in test 2, her z-score was 1.25, which means that her score was 1.25 standard deviations above the mean. To finish, I would like you to try this example, where Kaylee scored 23 in test A, 35 in test B and 17 in test C. Here we have the mean and standard deviation of each of the three tests. So you need to calculate the z-score for Kaylee in each of the three tests. And based on these z-scores, work out which was her best and worst result.